Hello everyone and welcome to how to calculate the values of a stock replica of a real rocket in Kerbal Space Program. This is KSP 1.12 and this came up because somebody asked about using Pekka's Starship in stock and normally I don't even configure my own rockets for stock particularly well, uh, just very roughly speaking. But I decided that uh, we would go through how to calculate the liquid fuel and oxidizer numbers for Pekka Starship. Actually, we should get rid of the mop propellants. Pekka changed the RCS on this to use liquid fuel and oxidizer. But how to calculate how much liquid fuel and oxidizer we should have in each stage, what the thrust of the engine should be, and various other numbers. So this is relevant both for if you're making a mod of a real rocket and trying to figure out what liquid fuel and oxidizer you're supposed to put in and the thrust numbers and stuff like that. Also, if you're trying to make a replica with the stock parts, how much liquid fuel and oxidizer should you have and how big an engine should you have to make it do what it's supposed to do, right? So once we derive the numbers, you can figure out what kind of tanks you should be using, roughly speaking. But, but of course, if you're using the stock tanks, then you're limited as to how close you can get in the numbers. Whereas if you're making a model in Blender and configuring it, and I'll show the configurations in a bit so that you can see what numbers we're changing, uh, then it will be much more accurate if you're making it in Blender, of course. But it is a bunch of math, and so the question is how do we get the math right or right enough so that it feels like sort of the right thing in Kerbal Space Program. So without further ado, we are going to have to do a lot of scribbling of numbers to figure it out. So you folks on YouTube are lucky. Uh, I did all this during a live stream uh, for Pekka's amusement perhaps, but uh, so that Pekka could get the numbers for the Starship. And there I just scribbled on Kerbal Space Program. Here I've got a nice white screen here, but it'll still be me scribbling, I'm afraid. So yeah, it's gonna be messy and we're gonna have to do calculations. The fundamental equation that we're going to be using is of course the rocket equation. So delta V equals exhaust velocity, which is ISP times 9.81, at least that's what we're going to be using. So that's exhaust velocity, it's extra numbers after, but we don't need those. Natural log of the mass that we start off with, oh uh, sorry, uh, yes, mass that we start off with over the ending mass, mass final. Uh, so that's the rocket equation, very simple. There are a few things that we're going to keep consistent between the real rocket and our replica. First, the payload mass. Of course, we want to get the same payload to low carbon orbit that the real thing does to the real orbit, the Earth orbit. And that'll help out too, because one con uh, concern is that the tanks might be OP, because in real life, the dry mass of the tank is much less than it is in Kerbal Space Program by default. However, if we keep the payload mass the same, generally it works out. Generally it ends up being about right. So we can work with that. Uh, the second thing we're going to keep consistent is the dry masses of everything. That will lead us to have one less unknown. We have to have fewer unknowns. And because we have the dry masses the same, we can also keep consistent the RCS thrust. So if you know the RCS thrust of the original system, we can just use that. Uh, because that has to maneuver the empty mass of the vessel anyway. So, yes. So that being the case, we have to adjust, the first thing we have to do is adjust the specific impulse, the ISP, of the engines, because everything else is based on that, you know, uh, the ISP goes right here, and we need to make sure that the ISP is correct. In Kerbal Space Program, by default, the ISP's range tends to be sort of tighter, and basically what we want to do is tighten up the real engines, and the way I do that is take the real ISP, if it's higher than 300, minus 300, and then divide by 2, and then after you do that, add back to 300. Let's take a look at this in relation to Starship. For the sea level engines, it is uh, 352 vacuum, that's the vacuum specific impulse, 333 sea level, and then for the vacuum engines, for the vacuum engines, Pekka's mod has 376 and 306. That's sea level. It can actually 
use the vacuum engines at sea level, incidentally. So if we do this, 352 minus 300 is 52, divided by 2 is 26, plus 300, that gets turned to 326. And then this gets turned into 316, really 316.5, but we'll do, keep it 316. This gets turned into 338, and this gets turned into 303. And you see that these numbers are more within the range of Kerbal Space Program by default, and also still maintain the relationship with each other. In other words, the vacuum engine is more vacuum optimized and all that business. So those are the numbers we're going to be using for our stages. Now, as far as plugging into the delta V equation, we're mainly going to be focused on the vacuum numbers. Okay. So now, how much delta V do we need from each stage? For each rocket, that's going to be different. Um, so for a rocket like Atlas V, for instance, the core does a lot more of the work. And you should calculate the core without the boosters, of course, in that case. Uh, we'll talk about boosters in a sec. Uh, but the core does most of the work. And then the Centaur stage actually lost payloads to higher orbit. It completes orbit, but its main job is to get payloads to higher orbit. So for the Centaur stage, you might need to judge by the payload to like the moon. And so mainly for that one, I'd say that the delta V for the first stage is like maybe 2,500 to 3,000. And then the Centaur stage does an extra maybe 1,500, 2,000 on top of that for the, its max payload. Uh, but We'll talk about Starship first. For Starship, we have the, the Starship and the Super Heavy. So for Starship, I'm going to say we want 2,000 meters per second, plus, and what we did was we went with 1,000 meters per second for its return and landing. That's a lot. That'll give people plenty of margin. But we sort of have to assume that people are going to be rookies on this and so we wanted it possible for rookies to use the mod or the thing and then you can make it tighter if you want 2000 meters per second means that it does most of the work the horizontal work to get to orbit the horizontal speed that you need is 2300 meters per second roughly and so the horizontal speed that we were expecting from super heavy then is about 300 and then the rest of it is super heavy getting us out of the atmosphere. So super heavy has to get us out of the atmosphere. The normal estimate I use for just getting out of the atmosphere is, so super heavy, is 1700. So it, again, it's luxurious, but we're going to have 2000 here, uh, 300 for horizontal, 1700 for getting out of the atmosphere and defeating drag. So we end up with the sort of uh, basic estimate for how much delta V you need to get into orbit around Kerbin of 4,000 there. But of course you can do it better than that. I mean, uh, we're estimating for uh, general users, not for like people who are really great at getting into orbit or anything. And we're also going to reserve 1,000 meters per second for its return. So we need 3,000 from each is what we're going for here. But again, depending on your rocket, you're going to have a different split and you can uh, judging from burn time is not exactly great. Uh, here we're doing it like this. So, and if you wanted a different split, we could have a different split. So, uh, let's give nice uh, give some room for calculating the starship number. Okay, so the delta v we want is three thousand. Okay, there's a different pen. Great. Okay, and that's equal to, for the vacuum engines, uh, well, well, we'll split the difference between the vacuum engines and the sea level engines for Starship. So we'll just go right in the middle of the two, and that's 332. So 332 times 9.81, and then times LN. Okay, so mass initial, the X there, and then here we have the mass final, which is the dry mass. The dry mass, uh, the dry mass of Starship alone is 120 tons, and then we're trying to carry 100 tons of payload. If you wanted to carry more payload with Starship, you would put a bigger number here. Uh, so 220. And then when we rearrange things, we end up with 3,000 over 332. Oh, 332 times 9.81, and then e to the that. E cancels out the LN, and then 
220 times that. 220 times e to the that equals x. So 3,000 divided by that. So 3,000 divided by 3256. Uh, so 0.921, let's say 0.921. 220 times that is equal to 220 times 2.511. So that is the total mass, the launch mass of Starship, 552. I wonder how it gets pulled like that. 552 tons. Let's just keep it to that. Oh, sorry for not uh, capturing a calculator there. I missed that. But then again, we it would have covered up what we were doing. Maybe I should put that in the upper upper corner instead of the lower corner. There we go. But hopefully you got the gist from the calculations down here. Uh, so this this block here ended up being 0 0.921 and e to that uh, gave us 2.511 and then 220 times that is 552 and then we take 552 subtract out the dry mass you know the pay uh, payload mass plus dry mass and then we get the propellant mass which is 332 so okay 332 is our propellant mass for starship let's clear all this stuff Okay, so 332 is the propellant mass, and then we multiply that by 90 to get the liquid fuel. And then 332 times 110 gives us the oxidizer. And so back with the calculator. We get 29,880 for the liquid fuel. And sorry, it looks a little bit like we've got 1,100 here, but it's only uh, 110 there. And there's 36. <laughs> I don't know how I end up getting the bold thing. Uh, 520. And so those are the numbers that we will enter in, ultimately. I don't know if they're the exact numbers that I got during the live stream, so we'll see that when we look at the configurations. But So we've got liquid fuel and oxidized numbers, and also we know the total mass of Starship is going to be 552. Super Heavy also needed 3,000 meters per second. It's only going to use the sea level engines, so 326 times 9.81. And then LN then we have a whole bunch of other business. I think it was dry 243, Pekka told me the number. 243, and then we have to add in the total mass of Starship. So 552. And then we're trying to find the fueled mass. 3198. I don't know how I managed that, but okay. So that's three, uh, it's not divide, it's 3198. So we end up getting e to the 3000 over 3.3198 uh, 0.938 is our exponent there e to the 0.938 that's 2.55 what was it again I can't see the calculator and the Photoshop at the same time, unfortunately. 2.555, it looks like. And then to that, we multiply. So that's after we cancel out the ln by doing the e exponential. And then we multiply this. So that's 500, 795. That's 2,031. So the launch mass is going to be 2,031 tons. And you could add in a little bit. Um, because we're keeping the masses all the same, right? We specify that we're keeping all the dry masses the same. The engine masses are going to be the same. The grid fin masses are going to be the same. The fin masses are going to be the same. We don't change any of that. Uh, we don't have to worry about that. So that is the total mass. And then, of course, we do 2031 minus 795 to get the propellant mass. They all get the hang of these little pens, but. 1,236, so, so an enormous 111,240 liquid fuel up there. 1359, was it 60? 
Okay, so let's take a look at the configurations to see what other numbers we need and what we need to talk about. So starting from the top, this is the Raptor V configuration. The mass stays the same. The scale for all models will be 0.64. So if you're modeling it, you should model it as in real life and then just say scale 0.64 here in the model section and then say scale 0.64 here and never change the rescale factor. Just don't. Uh, so everything in Kerbal is 64% the size of real life. And other than that, uh, well, the cost is uh, actually the best thing to do for something that has fuel in will just be to see a comparable fuel, well, not a comparable fuel tank, just get a fuel tank, get its price, and take the liquid fuel that we have in here, divide by the liquid fuel that that has, and then multiply it by the price of the original part. So if you have a tank that has 100,000 liquid fuel, and then the orange tank, the old uh, 2.5 meter orange tank, had 2,880 liquid fuel, you take your 100,000 divided by 2,880, and then that's how many orange tanks it is, and then multiply it by the price of the orange tank. So, and then engines, you'll have to see something that's comparable. We haven't talked about engine thrust yet, so let's do that. Uh, so what we ended up having for the engine thrust here, so we see the 326 and 316 that I had uh, put in earlier, and then we have 991 thrust. We got a total mass of Starship of 552, right? Let's see, 552. And it has six engines. And basically, we wanted a thrust weight ratio of one. So we wanted 552 tons of thrust with six engines. So that's 92 tons of thrust each, and then multiply by 9.81. That would suggest that we should have. Okay, so that gives us 902 kilonewtons, which is a good. But then we also have to consider the fact that the vacuum thrust the vacuum engines have a little bit more that's a separate thing that's a peculiarity of starship and also we have to take into consideration the fact that the first stage uses the same engines so then we calculated the first stage mass and it was over 2000 um, but it has 33 engines so 902 would be enough for it but Pekka uh, wanted 991 so we went with 991 so in that case the ultimate number came from what Pekka had himself calculated, but maybe I would have put 902 or something. So basically it's enough thrust to make sure after you've calculated the total mass of your stage, uh, what is going to give it a thrust weight ratio of one. Upper stages don't need a thrust weight ratio of one, and if you want to more better if you want to better simulate the situation, you can give them a more realistic thrust weight ratio, uh, something closer to the real life one, but keep in mind, Kerbin getting into orbit goes a lot faster, so you can't really push it. You can't have something like the Centaur stages that have 0.2 thrust weight ratio, 0.3 thrust weight ratio. The bottom limit probably should be 0.6, and that's only if your first stage is getting you really close to orbit. Otherwise, if it's doing half-half like we have here, 0.9 would be best. So. Mm. So what you would do is you would take the total mass of your stage, divide by how many engines you have, multiply that by 9.81 to get the kilonewtons, and then multiply that by 0.9 to get the a thr thrust weight ratio of 0.9 instead. So, but we did 991 there, and the gimbling engines have the same stuff. Uh, gimbling engines are a little bit heavier, but again, that's just from the uh, regular realism overall configuration, though that stuff is the same. Vacuum engines are heavier still, and they have a little bit more thrust. Uh, that's based on that can be based on the ISP if you have nothing else to work off of. Uh, probably you'll have the ratio between uh, sea level engines and vacuum engines in real life to work off of, so that's another possibility. The ratios for liquid fuel and oxidizers are always 0.9 to 1.1. Uh, now, for KSP-2, the ratios will be different. The only thing that's different about KSP-2 versus KSP-1 is that they're using methane and oxidizer, and there the ratio between the two is different. So then on the final calculation, when we did 90 and 110, you would be doing some other numbers. 
Okay, and I don't know what the other numbers are right now because I haven't done that yet. So this is Starship Cargo, and really nothing else needs to be considered uh, except, of course, the cost is complicated for uh, the cargo starship. It's a little bit difficult to decide on the cost for it. Uh, the tech required very heavy rocketry is obvious. <laughs> um, uh, so the liquid fuel, we uh, during the live stream I did it to a better accuracy and so we got an extra digit there. But that's the liquid fuel oxidizer that we calculated earlier. And then the RCS, the thruster power, I think I actually cut it down for this because I felt that it was a little bit too strong. But generally speaking we're keeping the thruster power the same. And of course for stock we have a reaction wheel because stock and otherwise nothing else needs to be done there. The flaps, uh, the complication is the control surface. Now that's not an obvious thing to calculate and what I decided to do was to pull up, and you can always do this, pull up one of the squad parts, one of the stock parts. So what the standard canard says is that this deflection lift coefficient, which is the only thing we really change, is 0.52 for a 1.83 meters squared area. So you can find the area of your wing piece or flat piece in this case and then take that area of your real one divide it by this number here and then multiply it by the deflection lift coefficient 0.52 and then you'll get the number. That's how we got the number for this flap here. Now another way of doing it is just to judge from mass. So you say, okay, well, for 0.1 tons of mass, we get 0.52 here. Then we should get, you know, we end up with a lot more for this flap. But the flap has a lot of heat shielding. It's pretty thick. So it's not your normal wing piece. So as the, you judging from the mass, we decide was not a good idea. And so same the parallel, parallel flaps and then these are the flaps in the back that have more deflection lift coefficient but we judge by the area using this thing divide by the area there and then multiply by that. And then super heavy we put in the fuel numbers and if you were using mop propellant, oh this needs to be changed, shouldn't be saying mop propellant there. Um, if you're using mop propellant of course you'd have to pack mop propellant. How much mod propellant? That really takes testing. There's no absolute value for that, unfortunately. There's no easy way to calculate that. And the grid fin should be based on area as well. So, and there's nothing else special about that. So, uh, let's talk briefly about boosters. Let me go back to Photoshop. So, if the boosters are lighting at the same time, it's tricky, especially with a Soyuz-like configuration where there's a core that's been burning the whole time or, you know, uh, uh, anything where the core doesn't launch on its own. Okay, so you got to end up with three stages. You have the upper stage. Uh, uh, let's just say, well, let's talk about Soyuz. So we'll say block I. And then you're going to have core without boosters. and then you're going to have core with boosters. Now in the case of Soyuz it's easy because the ISPs are about the same uh, after we adjust it. It's actually 308 for the core I think vacuum and that you know we we adjust it down to 304 in that case. So uh, oh gosh all right uh, 304 ish and the boosters and the core don't get too much different. So the ISP is 304-ish and we don't have to worry about that but we just decide how much delta V we want for each bit. So for Soyuz probably what I would do is uh, do 1500 here, uh, maybe 500 here and then 2000 here but you could probably split that up differently. Actually to make it depends on the thrust you have here. You probably want the block I, the upper stage to last a long time. You might want to have uh, lowered and thrust weight ratio of one on that and so after you calculate everything out and figure out the masses um, yeah I bet we, we might want this longer just to have the right feel and then that leads to this split so that's an option as well so it's a judgment call but this is 
Kerbin, you're not going to get it exact. One critical thing is that if you're worried, uh, if you're dealing with boosters, uh, make sure it gets out. <laughs> make sure, make sure it gets past max Q. Exclamation <laughs> mark. Uh, basically, you need to make sure that the original stack gets to a height of about 15 kilometers. If it doesn't, then you're going to have problems. Probably the bomb end for that is about a thousand meters per second. So, yeah, that's what I'd recommend there. But there's no no way to make it precise as far as the delta V split based on the real rocket. And the reason for that is because the nature of getting into orbit around Kerbin is fundamentally different than getting into orbit around Earth, because the thickness of the atmosphere is the same, more or less. Uh, the delta V that's required to get through the atmosphere is roughly the same. It's the horizontal speed that's different. So trying to make it feel right is tricky. And you can't just take the original launch and, and split it up between the first stage and second stage. So let's say the full burn time is eight minutes. And so you decide, okay, well, the first stage lasts for two minutes and the second stage lasts for six minutes. So in around Kerbin, it's going to be a three minute launch. And so the first stage should last a fraction of a minute. And then the second stage will be the rest, uh, the two minutes and 20 seconds, let's say in the first stage, 40 seconds. But if you only have 40 seconds in the first stage, you got me trying to separate the boosters while going through the speed of sound or max Q and you're going to have trouble. So yeah, it, it, we ultimately, the upshot of this is that we ultimately have more Delta V than you might think in the first stage of boosters and less Delta V in the upper stage compared to real life. If you really were to split it up, generally speaking. So anyway, that's the basic idea of how to calculate stuff for the stock parts. Tell me if I've forgotten anything I probably have. And I've done other videos on how to calculate things for realism overhaul, but I might do more of that uh, coming in the future. And of course, once we get some information about how mods in KSP2 are actually going to work and you know mod tools and such, uh, then I'll explain things for that if that ends up being a thing that people want to do so anyway with that thank you for watching hope you enjoyed this video if you did please do press like if you have any comments or suggestions please leave them in the comment section below and i'll see you next time